once we understand that life is a planetary process, that we're not individuals, that like there are more non-human cells in us and on us than there are human cells, that we're literally walking ecosystems, that that life and even matter shows up in relationship and through participation of consciousness. It, it just fundamentally shifts the nature of, of, of reality and, and it creates an understanding that to build an image, like competition exists in nature, but it is um, the waves on top of the ocean. It, they're loud, they crash together, they're impressive, so you focus on them. But the water underneath, like the all that depth all the way down to the Marianas Trench is symbiosis, collaboration, and life-creating conditions conducive to life. <laughs> Daniel Christian Wall is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Daniel is one of the catalysts of the rising regeneration and the author of Designing Regenerative Cultures. So far translated into seven languages, he works as a consultant, educator, and activists with NGOs, businesses, governments, and global change agents with degrees in biology, holistic science, and a PhD in design for human and planetary health. His work has influenced the emerging fields of regenerative design. Winner of the 2021 RSA Bicentenary Medal for Applying Design and Service to Society awarded a two-year Volans Fellowship in 2022. Daniel holds all these degrees and does numerous work all around the world. He lives in Mallorca, where he helped to set up Smart UIB and works locally and internationally as a consultant, educator, and activist among his clients who have been Ecover, Form for the Future, Camper, Belize, Belarist. What was that again, Daniel? Balearist. Balearist. Yeah. Save totally the Med, Lush, Unitar, UK, Foresight, Cloudburst Foundation, and many universities and NGOs. He has been on the academic working group of the Global Eco Village Network, GEN, and has been linked to GEN for almost 20 years. Daniel has worked closely with Gaia Education since 2007 and contributed to the design and development of the SDG multiplier cards. So I have those cards here. Uh, these are the SDG multiplier cards. Uh, they come in a big set uh, of multiple cards, beautiful colors, wonderful work done through Gaia Education. We're gonna talk a little bit about those. Daniel's book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, I have right here. Uh, I've read it numerous times, and I'm just so excited to have you on the show, Daniel. I have uh, recently saw you, luckily, in La Punte, Switzerland, at your 2040. Um, I have to tell you, honestly, this is the first time that we physically spoke and met We've been speaking since well before 2018, emails and had different chats, tried to collaborate and, and work together um, over the years. A lot of our fellow mentors and friends and people kind of cross collaboration or people that we both know and have interacted with, you much more than I. Uh, and I was nervous as hell because I revere you as a wonderful human being, a mensch and a mentor. Uh, I love the work you do. I love the type of human being you are and the interactions you have with people. And I'm so humbled and honored that you take the time to speak to me right before you go on your digital detox and kind of break, uh, break for the year to kind of get a rest and regenerate yourself. Thank you so much. 
Well, thanks for well, what what an introduction. I feel I feel humbled just by that introduction. But um, yeah, lovely to be um, on this show with you, and and uh, it was great to meet in person. It always just creates a deeper connection. Um, so it was, and what a be beautiful place to meet as well. Yes, it, it really is, and and I, we had a fabulous experience, or at least I did. I mean, um, regardless of heat and weather and and environment, there was just such probably one of the most beautiful places in the world and it's kind of a hidden secret where we met with great people kind of all hoping and desiring uh better futures and uh, around the theme of regeneration we were really fortunate to have those times and then enough time in between to stop and pause and have conversations amongst each other and I really appreciate some of those deep dives uh, that, that we were able to get into and to discuss. I have to tell you that I have to apologize, regardless of the great ac accolades that um, I gave you. I could read your biography for an hour because of all the things you've done over the years. You. Um, or a graduate of Schumacher College, you were uh, at Schumacher College, did different things with them. You've done things with Gaia Educations. You've you've done things with uh, Fritz Hof Capra and uh, not just the Capra courses, but had him on your podcast and, and different things. And I want to get into those relationships and those uh, things that you've had over the years. But I used to say and, and openly, very openly in all my talks and discussions, I'm looking for the university course, the cumulative breadth of, of knowledge and wisdom out there where I can combine systems thinking, symbiosis, regeneration, um, where I can think about futures and, and cultures and our, uh, our regenerative ancestry where there's one cumulative place to find that. And when Jeremy Lent came out with his book, The Web of Meaning, I was like, oh, finally, there's kind of a synopsis that talks about all these wonderful um, things in, in one book. And I, I, I honestly used to tout that as the number one book for people to go to and, and to read. But I have to apologize because I was totally wrong. Uh, I've read your book 12 times. I go to it all the time. It's much more depth, much more rounded, more systemic thinking. Also thinking about the terminology, the languages we use when we're thinking about our world and designing cultures and how uh, in Jeremy Lent's book, he uses ecological civilizations. That's a mimetic term that probably we should also discuss on this call. Um, but you synthesize those and you've connected to all these experts and thought leaders around the world to synthesize a, a beautiful work here that is something that I want to ask you, how do you, do you see this as a manual, a handbook, or as a source, a resource to guide people on these new thoughts? Or how, how did this emerge? And what is your hope for those who read it, what they take away from, from what you've created with your book here? Thank you. That's a lovely place to start. Um, well, you mentioned Schumacher College and that incredibly formative period in my life, which was um, after having f dropped out of academic research in marine mammal biology and um, wanting to be a, a field ethologist in m marine mammal science, and then a, a short uh, time as a diving instructor traveling around the world, I spent some years somewhat idealistically trying to set up an eco-village and environmental education center in southern Spain and then realized that there was so much more than I needed to learn um, in order to do that successfully if, after, after trying for 18 months. And that's when I went to Schumacher College in early 2001. And in those 18 months there, I had an opportunity to meet really pioneers of this environmental movement, like John Todd wrote the briefing paper for the 1972 conference on uh, the environment in Stockholm. Um, he later became a second PhD supervisor and, and, and a friend. 
And um, another person that that I met there was Henry Bortoft, um, a, a physicist and um, author of a book which is remarkable called um, The Wholeness of Nature, A Goethean Way of Science, um, really paying attention to the dimension of mind in how the world shows up to us um, when we look at anything, like when, when we create a narrative, when we when we form pictures of, of reality and our significance in it. And Henry gave me back then, I, I jokingly said, when I grow up, I want to write books like Fritjof Capra. Um, and, and, and he said, why would you want to write another book? There are too many books published uh, every day. Um, most of them don't sell more than 400 copies. And um, it's, it's a waste of paper and a, and a waste of human effort um, unless you really set yourself a deep reason and make it a work that works. And that notion is an alchemical notion, like a touchstone, something that the, the at the highest intention, it is that somebody is not the same anymore after they've read the book, that they've re literally been transformed in the process of reading it. And that comes to your, your question that, that how do I see the book? Like I, when I started to structure it and start to think about it, I, I very quickly ran into what I think is part of the, what Bio Akumalafi so put, beautifully puts in a, into a question. Maybe the way we, we respond to the crisis is part of the crisis. And the way we respond to the crisis is to find problems, define them in the abstract, and then with very abstract globalized problem definitions, this is how this problem shows up everywhere and it is a wicked problem and da, 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 da. We then bring in the innovators and the designers and the engineers to find solutions to that problem in the abstract. And so we get relatively abstract solutions to an abstract problem that haven't grown out of the cultural conversation in a particular place that haven't been from the beginning adapted to that place and, 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 and even questioned whether it is the right solution for that place. And therefore, we, we then get surprised when um, these solutions don't fit into particular localities. And that, that pattern, which I think is, is central to shift, I tried to shift by realizing early on that if I made a long list of interesting people I met that I had personal interactions with that I learned a lot from and that offered me solutions to certain aspects of this global problematic or um, wicked problem, um, I would quickly write a book that would lose relevance after five or six years because there's always new solutions and other people compete that that's a better solution and so on and so forth. And I suddenly realized that most of the solutions of the past have become today's problems. And so it would be arrogant to assume that that pattern is just suddenly going to stop with us and that all our solutions are going to be forever the right solution. And, and so I, in the book, flipped the solution thinking around towards we need to ask the right questions and we need to keep asking the right questions and we need to see solutions, prototypes, outcomes as prototypes, as something that that is good enough for now. But if we've implemented it well in a way that included and engaged the places where the implementation took place and the whole supply chain and all the users and the, the patrons, the people paying for it, um, then it's less the outcome, the solution, but the capacity and learning and capacity to work with each other and human relationship and trust that we generated through the pro project that outlives the actual project. And that's, I think, the key flip between working on sustainability in a sort of solutioneering, problem-solving mindset and working on regenerative development, which is it's not regenerative if it's an abstract thing. It has to be born out of the specificity of place and its culture. And so a book that has 250 questions in it, at least in theory, says, I'm not telling you what to do, but here's a lot of wise people that I learned a lot from. And if I abstract what I learned from them and flip it, rather than 
here are the 10 principles. Here are 10 questions that might be worth asking in your context. And then people take it on themselves to say, is that a question that stimulates meaningful, wise action in this place or not? And, and that's how it is meant to be used. It's men, meant to be used as a book that um, people just have an opportunity to reflect individually or collectively how these questions land with them, their working group, their community, their bioregion. Um, and that's how it's being picked up as well, apart from academics, like the, 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 the more and more universities are now using it as, as, as a textbook as well. I absolutely love it. And I, I use it as a textbook. I, I think the way you framed it with living the questions and the, the 10 questions and then tying in these great people and places of, of wisdom that you've collected over the years and that you've researched and studied and met and spoken with um, is, is exactly what I was looking for. There's another factor that comes in into that. So I ask a lot of questions. I've been doing that uh, my entire life uh, besides just the, the big why question. And, and, you know, um, it, it's really something that I've, that I've learned over time. And I'd like to know what your, your thoughts are. Are all the answers already within us? Do we already, as we're born, as we're emerged out of this primordial soup, as we're human beings, do we have the capabilities? Do we have those tools already within us to answer all the questions that, that basically the answers are already there within us, even though uh, we're kind of out there asking the questions and in this search of, of the big meaning and, and what is regeneration? What does a world that works for everyone? It, are the answers already within us? I mean, one of the key anchor points of, of this question-focused, living the questions in community approach, um, for me, has been a deep practice in the way of counsel, which is a, an ancient practice that is found in a lot of indigenous cultures around the world, of sitting in a circle with a talking piece and listening to each other from the heart while we speak from the heart and we keep it to an essence and we don't have an internal dialogue going on when we're listening, but we're actually listening. So we don't pre-formulate what we're going to say. Um, we're paying full attention. And in that process, you, you, you do get an experience of um, being able to voice insights that aren't coming out of the individual, but come out of the collective or even the wider context in which the group is sitting. And it's all, and, and so um, I did a lot of work with that with young people in, in kind of European leadership trainings and so on. And um, we always came, the, no matter what question we used as the starting question of the, the, the council circle, quite often this, this notion of living the question came up. Um, and, and this is actually related to the Rainer Maria Rilke quote I used at the beginning of my book, um, which says, it's, 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 he wrote this in a letter to a young poet in which he said, um, don't try to find the answers too quickly. They might be written in books, the language of which you don't know yet. Um, you have to live the questions and then one fine day you will live into the answers. And so I, the question, do we have the answers within us? I think we have the capacity to keep questioning within us and we have the capacity to keep evolving and, and, and make meaning individually and collectively. And, and how we make that meaning affects how the, how the world shows up to us, how, how we actually see ourselves and see the world. Um, but it's a, it's a dynamic process. Um, I think that our Western understanding of who is the do we, the us, in your question is also limiting there because the, the council from the beginning understands that a bird flying from east to west or um, a noise in the forest while you're sitting in, in, in the circle has significance. And it, it also, in the, the ritual of setting up a council, um, you invite the presence of 
past generations sitting behind you in long lineages of women, men and women behind your left and your right shoulder, and you have a fire or a candle in the center, which is the future generations. And by creating that kind of awareness space, you can take people into an embodied experience of understanding that insights, answers, ways of making meaning don't come out of what we normally identify as us, which is the skin encapsulated um, ego that has a body and dies at some point. And, um, and so I think that the question should be, does life already have the answers? And that's the beauty of life. It doesn't want to have the answers. It just wants to keep exploring new possibilities. And, and so, and that's what life is really good at. That's the regenerative impulse of life itself that it, it keeps as good to put it. Um, it keeps renewing the actors like the death is life's um, ingenious way to create plenty of life. And, and similarly, I think the, the answers are really simple, which is once we get out of the way and let life work through us, we, we have the capacity to work in full alignment with life's regenerative impulse because we evolved as regenerative keystone species expressing the ecosystems that we emerged from, not owners of regions or territories and and in that evolutionary journey we made ecosystems more abundant more bioproductive more diverse and we're only now beginning to see how extremely well um, indigenous people all around the globe have played roles in this generating abundance and um, I think that's that's basically what what we need to reintegrate into and it's not in a spirit of we've got the answers, but it's in a spirit of we've learned how to dance with complexity and uncertainty and not knowing enough. And we know how to be part and expression of the system at the right scale, predominantly local and regional, that we can actually re-inhabit Earth as living parts of our participants in Earth. And, and, and so that's, for me, more, the, the more relevant question on whether we have the answers in us. Um, we have the capacity to generate conditions conducive to life and live the questions. I absolutely love that, uh, creating conditions conducive to life. You also, at your 2040, um, and I've heard you say this before, but you talked about regenerative or regeneration ancestry or uh, ancestral um structures can you go in a little bit more what you mean by that well i think it's it's critical when we talk about regeneration particularly now that more and more people are picking up that meme and it is following the kind of pattern that happens when something gets popular that, that consultants and advisor and, and strategy and futurist types because it's new to them they kind of go oh this is the new thing and then they sell it as oh are you still doing sustainability or are you still doing circular are you still doing lean or whatever um i'm already doing regenerative and that that's so fundamentally misunderstanding what regeneration is all about but that in itself, everybody has the right to misunderstand something, um, isn't the problem. The problem is we're burning a key meme or a key understanding that goes so much deeper that is actually about re-anchoring our, ourselves in life and in a shared human story at this point of extreme polarization. So, so inadvertently all these people who just sell regeneration as the next thing already in the kind of mindset that let's see how long this one lasts i've gone through five waves of this as a consultant yeah and so they, they're already hedging their bets in their communication by by using flourishing and thriving because they have the sense maybe that's the next big thing in a couple of years yeah? and and that's unfortunate because what i mean by really wanting to work regeneratively is to understand that um, this is aligning with a 
core pattern of life itself. There's a beautiful conversation I had earlier this year with Fritjof Capra on, on YouTube. Um, if you put my name in his name, uh, it'll pop up. Um, and, and Fritjof gave this conversation a title, which was Regeneration, the Essence of Life's Capacity to Self-Organize. And that's a nice way of putting defining regeneration because it shows that that has been the case from the very beginning. Like we talk about Prigogine and the early um, kind of cellular assemblies of, of, of RNA, DNA and so on into proto cells and, and then cells with a nucleus, how, how there is this evolutionary capacity of um, explore, exploring diversity and then reintegrating that generated diversity at higher levels of complexity through new acts of collaboration and cooperation. And this is like throughout life, endosymbiosis, the, the evolution of social mammals, all of that. And um, we see this over and over again, that life has this, this tendency towards comp complexification and diversity and, and vitality and bioproductivity. And, and that is regeneration. And, and that, so that's the first anchor life is regenerative and what when we work regeneratively we're trying to align with a natural impulse the second anchor is we are not a cancer on the planet the current industrial growth society and the capitalist model of extraction is a cancer on the planet but we as human beings are capable and actually wouldn't be here have evolved as cooperative, regenerative species, our, our evolutionary advantage has been to A, be cooperative amongst each other, more than competitive. The competition existed, but cooperation is the core. And we also learned how to take our role as disruptors within the ecosystems that we emerged from in a creative way and learned how our disruptions, if timed correctly with natural processes, were actually creating more abundance rather than destroying. So, and, 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 and once we do that, those two anchors, then, then the whole conversation about regeneration shifts because we are realigning with a pattern instead of creating some kind of future utopia. And the big mistake that is currently being made when we talk about regenerative business and regenerative economics and this is to put it always in the future as something utopian that hasn't been created yet. Instead of looking at the future potential of the present moment of how caring, loving, uh, nurturing shows up everywhere in every community at every bioregion and fan those ambers, see that other side, the, half, the glass half full and, and say, Life's regenerative pattern is all around us. We just need to revalue it and value that over the extractive economic monetarized system. Absolutely. And I, I love how you, yeah. I absolutely love how you uh, you give us the 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 sense making and the depth and substance on those. And uh, you brought up uh Fritzhoff quite a bit and and that's great i'm also an alumni of the capra courses and of fritz Hof, and he's written a section in one of my books and we've, we've had a podcast as well you um do a couple podcasts i believe you do one for yourself and then you do one for rsa as well um and 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 mooc courses for the eth and that but i want to go in specifically um with Fritz Hof and the systems view of life. Matter of fact, I have his his book right here next to to yours and to Lynn Margulis's. You know the systems view of life uh, academic course. Uh, uh, yeah, fat, fabulous one. And then the other one is symbiogenesis. This is actually from the Russian before Lynn Margulis that Lynn Margulis translated that fell off the shelf. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to to talk more. So Fritz Hof. And you, and he also talked about it on my podcast. He said, you know, this isn't a meme. This regeneration isn't something new. Um, the first scientist that he is a big uh, student of or, or studied and researched and wrote, wrote about as uh, 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci, who, who talked about regeneration and, and ways uh, as, as a scientist and polymath. Um, but as you said, 
it's pretty much inherent in the way life has always worked. It's always been around. That's how we emerged onto the scene. Uh, were there others besides Leonardo da Vinci who talked about regeneration uh, beforehand? Are there known accounts in, in civilizations or in wise people of the world where they talked about how how life works and and regeneration in different forms before Leonardo that you uh, have talked about or researched and and why is that important or why do you think that would be important to kind of have that grounding that it's not a new me meme or trend it's just how it's always been and kind of what learning lessons can we take out of that deep history of this that we really don't get taught in school well, I mean, it's interesting. There's such a bias in the way we talk about history and even like Leonardo in this context, like basically Western science from the Renaissance to now has been on the journey of actually trying to rediscover our participatory wholeness and, and, um, and relatedness to the whole universe. But it has done so increasingly through a story of separation and, and, and objectifying. And um, like even Galileo and, and Giordano Bruno and all those early um, scientists have on the one hand helped to create something that is now becoming a science of the dynamic Earth system and, and, and understands the, the whole better, but at the same time, it created a particular worldview that is somewhat blind to the fact that it's never been separate, that the way of seeing um, that we use to build this powerful science is making the world show up in this object kind of way. And that there are many, many participatory worldviews in indigenous cultures all over the globe that actually were there all along. I mean, they didn't have the data and uh, theory and the peer-reviewed journals, but they were there in terms of understanding how to dance with complexity at a scale where mistakes would be visible and systems into higher states of abundance, the basic understandings of values that like you need to feed the system in order to feed yourself. And that that like self-expression and 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 abundance for self is best generated by caring for the collective, human or more than human. And and so I think that that kind of regenerative impulse is is just written deeply into the human story. Um, like I mentioned the examples earlier, I recently had um, Lila June on a, a recording that we're doing for the second series of the RSA podcast. And, and Lila June is, is a wonderful um, poet, singer, songwriter, scientist, who's just finished her PhD um, on basically how mainly focusing on North America, native um First Nations people in North America created the biodiverse system that we find there now. Like their their entire like the the big oak uh, chest, uh, chestnut forest in, in in the eastern United States, a lot of them were purposefully cut down because they provided long term food security to um, the the people living in these areas. Similarly, the the forest gardens of of the Pacific Northwest. They have higher species abundant, higher bioproductivity. Um, 200 years after the tribes that live there have, have, have been forced to leave, or 150 years. And um, there's so many examples, Terra Preta and the Amazon, like the, 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 the fertile soils below the Colombian Amazon have clear signs of being generated by a practice of biochar, vegetable carbon, mushroom mycelium and um, chips of, of uh, clay, uh, broken tiles, uh, kind of uh, pottery mixed into the soil in order to create a 
self-perpetuating dynamic um, soil ecosystem that, that that supports the the fertility of um, of those forests. So uh, we really need to reattune to what these indigenous cultures already understood, and then in a humble way bring science side by side to that. Because of course it is useful to have geospatial data about soil humidity and 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 um, species distribution and all of that, and um, it's but but right now our Western mindset is so arrogant towards the an analytical thinking mind that generates data and classifies object being the the one real access to reality and truth, and and denies. The core three other ways of knowing based on Jung's four dynamic ways of knowing um, that has are precisely the ones that indigenous people used, which is sensing, feeling and intuiting. They are all paying attention to relationship and being in right relationship with nature or more than human nature and humans as nature. We need to recover our human skills in these three dimensions they we have them in our lineage if we want to be able to manage the risks of the future by reintegrating human affairs at the local and bioregional scale in ways that we actually become gardeners again we we bring soil fertility water um like clean water um, standing forests, um, healthy grasslands and shrublands, um, mangroves, or, uh, wetlands, back to life, because we we do have science, and but what we need is the wisdom and the value that indigenous people have held um, for a long time, and also the understanding of long term cycles of ecosystems that that we are only now getting to in in, in Western science. There are, um, this is probably, we'll tickle again on, on Fritz Hilf, uh, again, but this is probably one that will wrap up um, leading into many other fabulous people. So he, he also, you know, did the systems view of life, the Tao of physics I have here, um, mm -hmm. and a few of his other books, um, The Web of Life. You said before, a work that works that's kind of was your purpose you know do a, do do a book a work that works um type of a of a creation that people can use that they can go out and live the questions that they can embody it and in that process you said i want to write a book like you know like fritolf how did that influence and is the systems view of life is the systemic view of how you set up the book, a work that works, addressing in the 10 questions, in the 10 that you've set up the book, the way you've done it, is it addressing all the facets of a complex system, helping us in that process? Did that play a role or a part in how you design the book? Because when I read it, and the reason I go back to it, is I see, and, and, and there might be something missing, and maybe this is the question that I'm asking you. Now that it's been out a while, you've spoken about it uh, to, to many people. Is there anything that you left out in, in this this kind of structure and the way you've done it that that you'd say, oh, if I were to do it again, I'd probably add add this question or this section? Because when when I read it, I see all the facets of a complex system kind of addressed in one, one form or another. There's, there's people that you discuss, things that you ask uh, in, in the book that just touch on, for me, this complete view of, of life and, and where we need to go and, and, and the questions as well. So I wanted to kind of ask what the influence and, and how you feel of, of, about the framing of that and if, you feel over the time yeah. if there's anything missing. I mean, first of all, like um, those days when when I first set the intention to write a book. I mean, that's 25 years ago. And then um, writing this book really started um, in a conversation with David, or um, after I'd finished my PhD. And, and much of the the kind of 
complexity research um, was in my master's and my PhD work. And I mean, my PhD was much, much bigger than this book, it was 750 pages, and um, tried to already create this sort of using this idea of the scales of design, which I build on, on, on a piece of work that Janice Berkland did many years ago. Um, and using them as a way of going from the small, like material science, all the way to planetary collaboration via um, so material science, product design, um, architecture, community planning, industrial ecologies, ur urban design and bioregional planning, and then um, supra bioregional national and international collaboration. Um, and that gave me a sort of framework in which to look at all of these, how do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again, using the power of design. And, and then I also created a number of sort of scale linking issues like water, energy, and, and so on. But importantly, and this is also part of what is so, to my mind, this dual need to, to bring into people's awareness is, is this how powerful science is if we use science as a tool and how dangerous science is when it stops being science and it becomes scientism, meaning it, it becomes dogmatic in its claim on reality and um, the only truth and nothing but the truth. That doesn't mean that it's not probably the best intersubjective consensus making activity we've discovered as humans to come to some kind of agreement on the nature of how certain things behave. So power, it's ext extremely powerful. But, but we, um, for, for me, in, in my book and in my PhD research, in my PhD research, I called it, because it's academic and I needed a fancy word, I called it meta design. Um, but really, it's the organizing ideas, the mental scaffolding, the key narratives, the um, fundamental assumptions about the nature of rea reality, our epistemology and ontology that fundamentally shape how we see the world and what we even identify as needs or problems or stuff to work on. And it will inform how we then design solutions and at what scale. And so I, I be began to realize that that we really need to always not just talk about solutions and the stuff that is out there and, and, and good ideas, but we need to actually question the organizing ideas that put us, give us our marching orders, that, 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 that inform our practice. So this false dualism of theory and practice, I also ad address in the book, that, that um, like design follows worldview, but then Churchill was also right. First, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. So worldview follows design. And we've created a world that is all around the notion of separation instead of collaboration and, 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 and interbeing. So to come to, the, to your question of, is there anything that I would have added to the book or highlighted more? I mean, we already spoke about that I could have somehow people picking up the regenerative culture meme as a utopian thing that should be created in the future. And it's nice that they're picking it up and they're saying this is worth, this is a worthwhile proposition for the future of humanity. But I think I would be more stressing this notion of how even the mental framing of past, present, future is ultimately emerging out of a particular way of seeing and that there is real agency only in the present because it's like we've uh, you've been in on, around the block for many years how much time have we lost because we were talking about future visions if we had if we had understood more than what we need to do is activate the future potential in the present moment how would our movement be different like how many meetings about strategies and implementation are all blinded because we actually believe that prediction and control and and implementation and key milestones and all of all of that will lead to ultimately some form of fata morgana 
destination sustainability, destination regenerative culture. And when we only get there, then everything will be fine forever after. And that's mistaken. We need to build our capacity to keep journeying and we need to work on what we can do in the through the future potential of the present moment. And the only way that we will find out where that potential lies is by activating the huge potential in each and every human being who wouldn't be here if they didn't have a unique contribution to life as a planetary process. And the same for every other species on the planet. But we can't do it, we can't hold that complexity in some sort of global way. And that's why we invented abstraction and analytics and data collection on some abstract picture of that. But if we flip it and we go into that complexity through the uniqueness of place and the uniqueness of people in place, and we meet each and every human being as, hello, <laughs> what do you have to, what role do you have to give to it? Like, how can you flourish and be the most highest expression of yourself in service to your community and your context and ecosystem? And if we created education systems and communities and narratives that did that at the local and bioregional scale, then all these problems would just dissolve because we'd be living into the solutions um, at the right scale. And, and, and that, for me, somehow the book, because I tried to build a bridge, some of the languaging when I read it now is still kind of a bit solutioneering. Oh, look at that. We have all these fancy things in biomimicry and in product design and architecture. And, 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 but because people want examples. But the danger is that the minute then people see examples and then they get into cut and paste or I want an Eden project in my town. That's not how we, you create regenerative systems. And, and, and maybe that's where I would have, it, it's in the book, but I would have cranked up the, uh, the contrast on that more. And the other thing that's also in the book is the deep root of regeneration and in indigenous knowledge. But again, I, I, I feel like I could have cranked up the contrast on that a, a lot more throughout the book. Um, so the, the, like the, the, the two anchors, anchoring regeneration deeply in life and anchoring humanity as a keystone regenerative species in the ecosystems that we emerge from, uh, those... I say a lot more clearly now than I did um, when I wrote the book. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, I, it's always um, a sheer pleasure to, to listen to you speak about us like you wrote the book yesterday as you bird this baby and it's still there and it's not only evolved, but it's um, really you live it and, and breathe it and um, live the questions. <laughs> I, I, I love that because those insights, that sense making is really what we need to, to get where we need to go to, to get that understanding of how um, this journey looks like. And in, in that process is interesting because you did touch a lot on the sustainable development goals. And, and you worked on these flashcards for Gaia education and, and, really wonderful, beautiful cards. Can you tell us why you decided to get involved in that and how this project looked, why you you find that so fitting and tying? Do you still have the same feelings you do about the SDGs that you did then? And also, you, you just uh, touched upon it just basic, barely, um, We've wasted a lot of time mm. talking about it, discussing it, instead of getting into that action, into the work. Mm. Uh, and, and I'd like to know your thoughts about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a perfect example of the pattern that I was just speaking to the SDGs. Um, Basically, you mentioned my, my long-term connection to the Global Eco-Village Network and Guy Education. Like in my own journey, I... Um, had this, like many inspired hippies in, in their 20s, this idea that could I just get my, my best friends together and, and form an intentional community and live as part of the solution rather than part of the problem. That was a, sort of the early motivator of, and then, then we could use that as a kind of demonstration site. Um, so I, I had this idea of blending 
the Center for Alternative Technology, Findhorn, and Schumacher College into one dynamic community in, in southern Spain. Through this like journey into like working with with guy education and the global eco village network i also somehow ended up being close to the un process because findhorn had a permanent representative at the united nations and was involved in setting up the spiritual um, caucus in in the united nations the group that meditates when there's um meetings of uh, the security council there's actually a meditation chamber under the the main hall and, and people from all faith groups come together to, to meditate for positive outcome. And, and Finhorn was involved with that. And through that, there was an open door that made the Global Eco Village Network become a um, ECOSOC NGO. So um, a consultative NGO to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. And through that, um, like the UN Habitat Award to to um, to, to Findhorn and then to Guy, uh, to, to Jen and um, the involvement in Rio Plus, uh, like first the, the first Rio conference and then the involvement in, in Rio Plus uh, 20 and all, all the other ones in between meant that when the SDGs were proposed, um, Guy Education was involved in the consultatory process, the one that, that kind of included over a million people in every country on the planet. And um, so it was obvious that when they came out, that we should somehow um, create a program related to them because the all the other ones, the, the Guy Education Design, Eco Village Design Education, face-to-face 125-hour -face course that, that is a sort of whole systems design for sustainable communities um, curriculum, um, that was from the beginning part of the UN decade for education for sustainable development. And, and so was the online course. And I had just written my book, but it was with the publishers when, um, like the book was finished 2015 and it was a year with the publishers. And it was exactly in that year that May East, the then CEO of Guy Education asked me, can you develop a short because we all had these long courses either a month face to face or um like a course that was 12 12 months of studying online and um, they wanted a short course and so i inspired by the cards that people were using in um, the transition town training as a facilitation tool asked myself could we create a set of cards that would introduce people to the um, the different S SDGs and, and May East was also using just printed out the 17 SDGs in a kind of early workshop that, that, that she'd started running. And so building on that, I combined it with the approach in my book of saying, um, how do we get people engaged through questions, not by telling them what to do? And how would we get people to think more strategically and more systemically about each and every one of these 17 SDGs? Well, let's just take the lens that Guy Education developed and actually, I believe, has fundamentally influenced the UN discourse with this lens um, because we were the first in 2005 to create a four-legged stool of sustainability. Everybody was walk working on the three-legged stool of social, economic, and um, ecological and guy education actually wanted to bring the fourth legged stool spirituality in but then it was a mimetic decision in terms of effectiveness to call it world view to be less um, triggering for people and the un now calls it cultural but the un now works with a four um, dimensional understanding of sustainability and what what it's actually trying to do, say is what I just earlier said about meta design. It's bringing in the way that we see the world as a key contribution to how we even think of social, ecological, and economic issues and the solutions to them and the scale at which they need to be solved. And um, so, with these cards, I was already skeptical about the. SDGs, how they turned out. I was particularly skeptical about what I would call the Trojan horse in the SDGs, which is SDG number eight, um, good work and continued economic growth. Um, that 
at the very least would have to be reframed as good work and qualitative growth to be able to do a compromise and, and Aikido with it. But the way it's actually naming the dogma of continued economic growth as a necessity, otherwise the capitalist economic card house crumbles. If it doesn't grow at 3% per annum, that's doubling of the economy every 27 years. Um, that's about that, that can only run against the wall. And, and yeah, so even um, in the icon, it shows it shows yeah, the growth in the exactly. icon logo. It shows, you know, growth and it's growth, crazy. Growth, growth. Yeah. So so and and um, Christian Felber also call it, calls it the Trojan horse. In, 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 so there's other people who've called this out. Absolutely. But anyway, in that context, I I said yes to the job of building these cards. So these cards for me are what I would call um, positive, subversive Aikido with the system. They are have all the questions. So you can see in the in the colorful boxes there. You can see that they approach every SDG G from the four dimensions. And in the colorful boxes, there's a little bit of information about what's a social take on um, no hunger, what's an economic take on no, no hunger, what's a worldview take on no hunger, what's an ecological take on no hunger. And um, then on, in the white boxes that we that are above these colorful boxes in the back, um, there are sets of questions. And so what these cards are for is that people in place can, with the help of a facilitator, create small group processes in which they sit around the table, like World Cafe style, writing on, 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 on the napkins or the, or the, the tablecloth. Um, how is this SDG relevant to us? in this place what do we already know in this region that is working on this even if they don't use the sdg framing and how could we use three or four of these sdgs and bring them together and create a fascinating new community project in our region these are the kind of questions that that people are invited into so it, it's it's literally a process that says the united nations with a massive consultatory process has come up with 17 goals for humanity and has called them the global goals. How do we implement them? By making them our local goals. And we won't take it for granted that they got it right the first place. So we're now in a process here locally to look at these 17 goals and make them our own and look at how we can Im implement them right here, right now, and how they're already being implemented by people who don't even know the goal exists. And that process would have been if rolled out globally and focused on for the first five years of the SDG, a powerful process of leading with implementation and, and, and a local anchoring of these goals. But what did we do? We spent umpteen conferences and huge amounts of carbon emissions to do national scale and continental scale or city level reporting on progress when we hadn't even started projects to implement yet. Like the, the, the people went straight into a massive mas machinery of reporting on where are we and where do we want to be, like the kind of benchmarking at the beginning. And it's so the wrong mindset. And it, it burned people out on them because it was very bureaucratic. And I, it even diverted in a so, almost sort of predatory delay type of way. I saw this, like people that I'd been working with that had previously been traveling, but using those carbon emissions to actually land in a place and then spend 10 days capacity building with 200 people in Bangladesh and then go off to Senegal and do the same thing again. Those people suddenly went to meetings in whatever fancy place in the world to spend three days hanging out with bureaucrats, working on documents that were like reporting on sub point whatever of the 169 sub goals and it it was just the bureaucrats taking it's, it over it, and it's a, it, i agree with you it's such a, a bureaucratic process and and those documents and the reports and the meetings the the reports that they generate are so thick and overwhelming there's no action behind them it's just all about data statistics what's happened where stock takes where are we at and there's no actual action that gets to, gets put into practice. There's no living the SDGs 
You know, if we want to reframe, you know, living the questions, there's no living the SDGs. There's no putting it into community, culture, or place of the SDGs. And now we have seven years left to go to get there um, before this decade's out, December 2030. And it's really um, interesting because you say, you know, kind of the Trojan horse, the skeptical aspect of it. I'm with you there as well, even though, you know, I wrote the SDG manifesto for the UN and I still talk about them. It's the world's first ever earth shot. It's a, it's its own ecological economy, economic model, uh, the sustainable development goals. But the skeptics that I'm hearing now, and I'd like to see what you think about that is, the SDG woke or the ESG woke or that it's a Klaus Schwab conspiracy theory that everything that kind of helps me that you have just said is no, actually this is a real legitimate process that occurred in, in a side meeting in Bogota, Colombia, and then it transitioned and was ratified at uh, Rio plus 20. And they were talking well, about sustainable <laughs> It was ratified that they're not work ratified on it. that they would decided, ratify that they would work on it. I, there's, I think, there's they, even another they, they term. Decided, they decided in 2012 at Rio Plus 20 to make the um, MDGs, which was like the MDGs, also the Millennium Development yeah. Goals, had a sell-by date, and that was Rio Plus 20. And so they 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 said, when do we um, come? Well, what, what's coming after the MDGs? And, and they decided that we need to develop them further and include the, the whole climate change and sustainability and biodiversity dimension to, into them because the MDGs were very socially focused and, and community focused. And um, what was ratified in Rio plus 20 was just that we will now work on the SDGs and they will be presented to the world in 2015. And in September 2015, they were launched. And yeah, uh, I mean, the, 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 the discussion that you, you mentioned, you know, that even uh, Findhorn and, and others were working on this before is not anything that ever anyone hears about the development and how that happens. But what we're hearing now is not only, you know, uh, people Oops. want to adopt a new I'm SDG. A they're talking about the SDG woke. They're talking about conspiracy theories. And still, the, the, the biggest thing that we've uh, kind of synthesized so far is, is we're not putting them in the action. We're talking about the wrong things to even get, get started. Um, and we have seven years left to go. But there are already other set of goals after the SDGs that, that we know have begun, uh, begun in 2019. And so... It's just interesting to see your connection and how, how you've dealt with that and how you also feel and have legitimate concerns as I do or anyone else does, but that you take a different lens on how to approach it and, and what they mean. I believe you've also said this before, and I'd like to hear it from you instead of me trying to repeat what you've said. How do you feel regeneration ties into the sustainable development goals or sustainability ties into regeneration? And how, how do you normally frame that as well as resilience? Hmm. Well, I, I never like that, that pattern that we already talked about that you, that the Western mind likes to think in terms of the Kantian dialectic of thesis antithesis, like, to bring in something new, it has to be the opposite of the old. It's sort of a bit like the, 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 the um, paradigm shift and, and so on. It, it, it sets us up tragically to, um, when we bring in something new, to um, not learn from the past, to throw out the baby with the bathwater. To um, and, and so for me, there's a, there's a real opportunity to still work with the SDGs in the next seven years. Like, for example, like these cards that we just talked about, they have pretty much all the questions that are in my book written into a educational system that is hinged around the SDGs. They also have written a critique on the insidiousness of the UN development agenda and its developed versus non-developed nation framing that created a lot of like we are not worthiness in nations of the global south 
where they were actually still much more living within the sweet spot of planetary boundaries and and, and social foundations. So um, in I think we could use these cards if they, if if these cards were used in schools and and community local participation processes led by town halls, led by universities, led by, by local or regional businesses, um, they would talk about the SDGs and go beyond them through these cards. So because right now, like with everybody just bringing out reports that the, it's dead in the water and we'll never reach the goals and, and, and so on, it's kind of killing um, the impetus behind them instead of saying let's use this in a kind of positive aikido way and and make it make it local uh, um, and make it a process in which the the localities the ruralities the regions feed back about we try to implement them and make them our, our own and this is what we came up with and then use that as the basis for whatever the next version is um, rather than now bind the energy of lots of people in in um in formulating the thriving or the inner or the um flourishing or the regenerative development goals <laughs> or it's it's um but yeah and what was the other part of your question just, just really i mean you you how you relate because you feel uh, that uh, uh, yeah, yeah. sustainability yeah. and regeneration Similar, that's why I went into the whole kind of Kantian dialectic bit. Um, it's a danger to dismiss everything sustainable just because everybody now works about uh, on, on or wants to work on regeneration. Um, but there is, like we talked about all of this already, like um, the problem solving mindset from abstract problems and the kind of war on climate change or war on loss of biodiversity or whatever we do do wars on the the, the big global problems that we try, try to create big global strategies to counter that's to my mind not a very way a good way of of actually getting stuff done um they're important issues but we need to work through the potential of people and place and work on these solutions and enabling these solutions at local and bioregional scales that for me is is a shift away from from a of a way of doing, but that doesn't mean that there aren't lots of really good people having done really good work working on sustainability for the last 20, 30 years. There is a little bit of an issue that sustainability in its early um, roots, like the German forester, Karl von Karlowitz or whatever, already had a utilitarian value of nature in mind when he was talking about sustaining the forests. Um, and creating a sustainable forest forestry practice. So um, one could say that there are issues with sustainability from the get-go because it has this very human-centric um, nature as value for us perspective and the regenerative perspective as an ancient perspective on life's regenerative impulse handed down the millennia by indigenous cultures all around the globe has a very different um, valuing of nature. It understands the intrinsic value of every species. But but I think we need to, like, it's, it would be really wrong to torpedo all the good work in sustainability just because now people are waking up to, oh, maybe we should move on to regeneration. Eh? And then it's just ridiculous. Then resources get get put into teams trying to even understand, is it different or is it not? And what, what ends up happening is that, that lots of people sell old wine and new wineskins. Like um, so many of the recent people jumping on onto regeneration, like great that the BMW Foundation is talking about it, but so shallowly. Yeah. And great that Systemic IQ, a bunch of ex-McKinsey consultants now want to take regeneration into business. But maybe be humble enough to say, how is this different from what we've done all the time? No, they just use their old methods and slap a new wineskin or a new label on, on their, their, their wineskin. And that that's what's frustrating. So um, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate that. There's two things that came out of, out of that I just wanted to ask. So 
Um, I know Helena Norbeg Hodge, you've had her on, you've spoke to her again, is what she's doing with local futures, local economies and world localization thing. Is, is that uh, one of the better solutions that, that we're seeing to kind of bring things back to the right bioregional place and, and working on that? Or, or are you seeing other better solutions um, out there for really implementing the SDGs locally, regeneration locally, that also ties into um, kind of the practice of, of, of living the SDGs, of putting into practice, getting out of all the negative things that, that you just discussed. Mm -hmm. is, is that one big solution? That popped up in my mind as you were discussing that as well. So that's why I'm asking. Well, fundamentally, like if we understand our regenerative nature, our lineage as a species, then we uh, built into that is a local stroke bioregional um, embeddedness that is necessary for us to even understand ourselves as part of a dynamic system and um, take our role as um, gardeners or, or generators of abundance um, serious because we understand that we depend on that. Um, and so I've known Helena for by now 23 years and, and she's been remarkably consistent in highlighting that it's not enough to just localize, but we also need to understand the structural violence and the corporate superstructures that actually have been rigged against any form of local and regional production and consumption. Like we're actually living in a world where while we believe that there is national sovereignty, each nation or most of the nations have bought into and signed up to international tariffs on trade and, and um, all those trade rules that during the 90s have shored up the system for transnational global corporations to act outside of the jurisdiction of nation states. And, and that's what she keeps highlighting that we are up against. L less so kind of too much nationalism and na na national structures. The nation states are also um, kind of be beholden to this. Like it, it's a simple, uh, simple example here on Mallorca, if, if we convince the regional government that it should create a law that the hotels on Mallorca need to try to get to whatever 40 or 50 percent local provision in the next five years and to 60 to 70 in the next 10 years. That could easily be challenged by anything from Coca-Cola to whatever to say, no, 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 that's unfair. You know, now you're biasing the market and saying uh, we can't sell our product there anymore. That's protectionism and, and you signed up to a treaty that, that makes that illegal. Um, so, so that's the kind of work that I really appreciate about Helena's work, that she, she highlights that. But um, she then has a little bit of a take that uh, lately she talks about regeneration being a planted meme, like another kind of... Uh, Schwab theory, conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I completely align with her on the need for local economies and, and increased local community resilience and increased self-reliance. But I think what we need is a very nuanced conversation of how to support that. And, and that A means that local only makes sense in a bioregional context. It's not small individual villages, it's cities, villages, and a region working on a bioregional scale to increase provisioning to the local pop regional population um, through regional production and consumption in a way that drives increased ecosystems regeneration as the basis of that local economy uh, or regional economy. Um, there is a conference coming up in Bristol called Planet Local, and, and Helena has, because she's done such amazing work and highlighted so many important things with also her work from, her lessons from Ladakh and, and Ancient Futures and all that, um, it's a remarkable group of people that is coming together for that conference. And I'm, I'm 
I don't go to conferences anymore because I like to stay local, but but I'm, I am going to that one because it is um, like the degrowth people and Charles Eisenstein and Bayer Kumilafi and and um, local food. Russell people. Brand, I think, is the host, isn't he? Yeah, um, that one. I yeah. <laughs> I'm not yeah, too sure yeah. if, if, if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it, it supposedly gets gets media coverage. But um, but it's like Lila June and her mother Pat McCabe and um, and the, the guy who wrote the book on like what's his name Perkins that wrote the book on Richard Perkins yeah. Regeneration uh, Regenerative Agriculture. I think it's a great book. Um, anyway. I feel we could really have a nuanced conversation there around how regenerative cultures, bioregional regeneration, um, localization, um, circular local economies, um, regional economies, how they could all interact, how, how that links to transition towns, how that links. And we could really build a movement. My fear is that that Helena, because I had, two days ago I had a long conversation with her about this off the record, and um, and and it's we keep getting into yeah, but don't you see like we need to use local and we need like she just gets stuck on two or three must do it this way and and that normally creates not a space where where such a diverse group can then um, co-create. And so, so I, I hope it's going to work out. Um, I think that the, the push towards localization um, is definitely something that I would say is a, is a lived trend at the moment. I find the manifestation of people at the regional scale trying to have a more nuanced approach that is global, that is global and local, that, that, um, that asks can, what technologies and to what extent powered by what renewable energy source can we still use in the future to give our local population not just provisioning of basic needs, but global connectivity and co collaboration and so on. And that's when it's not a black and white thing towards sort of ultra local, um, only biomaterials based economies. That, that we, if we want to have a communications infrastructure, we probably will have to do some mining and some energy use dedicated to that. But we need to ask ourselves how much energy and mining do we waste on things that really have no significance to the well-being of humanity. And we, we, we simply need to ask questions of if in 10 years' time we we'll only use a fifth of the energy and a fifth of the material throughput, how would we de deploy that energy and that material throughput in a way that it would give the most amount of people, the best quality of life. And that's a question that addresses both international inequality, like between nations and intranational inequality. And then also the, the, the obscene cast of 2000 billionaires on the planet that supposedly are saving the planet. And they are, the, the structural, like the existence of a billionaire is a structurally dysfunctional structurally violent process. So no matter how much they deploy their billions in, in the right way, um, their manifestation of, of, a, of a dysfunctional extractive system put a cap on <laughs> what kind of financial power can even be in the hand of, of one person or one um, corporation. Because um, it's not the governments that pull the shots anymore. It's, it's, it's a few corporations and the individuals that own them. So you, you, with uh, World Localization Day, Helena Norberg Hodge, and this kind of local futures, local economies, and things, I appreciate you going more into that depth. And, and you know, I hope the right people will go to Bristol and see that. That that was just one of many um, people that I know that has also been on the podcast that we've seen. But there's been numerous works that have popped up speaking about regeneration, speaking about place and local solutions, getting into uh, uh, how we answer the questions, how we live the questions, how we create place. Um, 
Regenerative Leadership from Laura Storm, Giles Hutchins, Leading by Nature by Giles Hutchins. He's done five fabulous books, and then he did that with Laura Storm. Regeneration from Paul Hawken uh, came out after the drawdown. Um, then we have a wonderful book from Satish Kumar, uh, Regenerative Leadership, mm -hmm. or Regenerative Learning, sorry, not leadership. That was uh, Laura Storms and Jaws such as Regenerative Learning. Uh, we have another book, Regeneration, as well. So obviously, we're seeing don't, don't forget the people don't forget come. Carol up. Sanford, regenerative. Business. Carol Sanford, and her, she has a regeneration series, right? One book is called Regenerative Business. All the other ones have don't have regeneration in the title, but basically, I think the title of the one following regenerative. Uh, no, there are two. There's there's regenerative business and living a regenerative life. And then the yeah. and then the next one is called indirect work, and there's one coming out now. Um, and indirect work for for me actually summarizes really beautifully how um, regeneration is actually done best. So the, I think the, they are great books to start with as well. Yeah, I've I've read them all. I've got them here on the shelf. I didn't pull them off to to show at this time. There's uh, another one uh, right here that I have is fairly new. But is yeah that one I'm, the, that one the, I'm, I, I don't know how you think about this have you read it i i would like um i'm trying to have a conversation with christian after the summer um i did uh, read an article that summarizes it all and it it felt like it was just very polarizing and it's like it it sort of tried to establish this is regeneration this is resilience this is um sustainability this is green and and it, and and it was just typecasting and misrepresenting and um it feels to me like one of those wow must position myself as the guru in the marketing and regeneration corner and must have a book to um beef up my consultancy offer on on the back of that and that doesn't mean that the guy isn't doing wonderful work and hasn't done wonderful work and 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 I just wish that they would all be a little bit more um, aware that in order to understand what this regenerative approach and regeneration is about and really and fully comprehend the depth of change in worldview and participation that it actually entails when we come back to that, um, we need to do a shed lot of unlearning. And people who are, have learned stuff and got feedback that everybody thinks that they have a lot of important things to share, find it really hard to unlearn. And me included, probably. <laughs> but but um, but I, I feel that, unfortunately, what is now happening is that people, in the best of intentions, say, how do I blend all the cool things I know how to do and put them in service of this thing, regeneration, that I want to be part of? But they don't pen, uh, spend enough time on, of understanding how that thing is actually challenging to fundamentally look at themselves, look at how they relate, look at how they approach problems, how they um, work in what they work and how, yes, their skills might be super useful, but how they also need to be looked at carefully, how the core memes and organizing ideas they use in language have agency in and of themselves, so they need to be questioned. And for me, that book is is kind of uh, close but no cigar. Like it, it, it uh, and I haven't even read it yet. Uh, I'm just concerned that it will contribute to the noise rather than the signal around regeneration. Um, so hopefully, I'll find time over the summer to to take a closer look at it because I don't want to diss it based on that one article. And hopefully, I find time to talk with Christian about it. Um, but yeah, it, now it's out. Pe people will yeah, read it. And now it's out. Yeah. Now people are going to read it. Um, I, I also got the exact same feeling and uh, when I read it. So I'm, I think you're spot on. Um, I'd like to hear after you read it if, if you still feel the same way. I, I, I feel the same way that you just synthesized it. Uh, on, on regeneration from Paul Hawken, do you think – that was spot on. Do you think there was also a mismatch? Uh, did you help with that at all? Is, how do you feel about that uh, book coming out and the website and the kind of, I felt there was a lot of ways to bring it back to place and that 
in, in the book as well. But I'd love to hear your view and your take on it as well. I mean, Paul's done a lot over the years to stimulate a dialogue. And I, I remember that, I, I think it's in 2009 that he gave a talk at Bioneers on, on regeneration. And so um, it's also for him to put his kind of meticulous way of working and knowing how to launch a book and position it with to be become a bestseller and, and, and all of that. He's, he's created an industry on how to write his books and, and, and make sure that they become bestsellers. And it's wonderful that an elder in, in this environmental conversation um, puts their name also behind this regenerative impulse. Um, I find that the, the way that it is presented in the book Regeneration and the website um, still edges a little bit on this kind of here's a catalog of solutions and now just go out and copy paste them and everything will be fine. And it is a little bit technologically biased as like uh, if we just use the right technologies, then it will. Like it doesn't fully go into the structural, the functionality of um, the current energy and material um, use on the planet. Um, and it's wonderful. Like it's, it's and, and as was drawdown because there's so many people that really needed more education on already fu functional alternatives to business as usual that would at least buy us some time um, as a technological stopgap. Um, and, and a lot of them are, yeah, it's a great way of, of approaching them. And then, then he also does go into the more systemic things like educating um, children or women in particular having a huge effect or um, looking at localizing food economies. Or I mean, so, so I think it's, it's, it's great work. Um, it could have been more powerful if he had taken a sort of Savodaya Gandhian approach, rising of the all, like used his thing to lift a, a whole tribe of people working globally on this. I mean, this is what, like with regeneration rising and voices of the regeneration and like this kind of... Um, meme that that i've put out there around we are the regeneration and when are you going to join us uh, we are the the generation that has to re fundamentally redesign the human impact on earth within the lifetime of generations of life right now um from being by and large degenerative and exploitative and destructive to being by and large regenerative restorative and collaborative um and had he done that, like that's what he's doing with both drawdown and regeneration, but had he done that even more so highlighting the people that helped him build those two platforms, highlighting individuals and their stories rather than technologies, um, I think it would have been more powerful. So, so um, I, more power to him, but I think he comes from a generation that has a slight kind of narcissistic way of working as a change agent. And, and, um, and that often means that when larger collaborations are building, Paul isn't the best key, key player uh, of it, where he ha would have so much to offer and is such a brilliant communicator in mind. Um, and so uh, deep respect and, and, and a little like... Um, compassionate regret that says if you got your ego out of the way a little bit more you your work would be even more powerful and and impactful and possibly also feeding a lot more into um the old way of be doing business the old formats of business what 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 are businesses going to pick up on and see that they can use the, the memes the wording the immediate solutions. Okay, now we've got a book that lists all these solutions. We can just go in and plug them in and, and it's going to work. Um, I kind of get that sense as well a little bit. But it's of, important work. Book. Like it's, it's basically, it's just the different levels of the funnel and we, and, and some people will take that as the be all and end all. And that's the, the downside of, of that approach. 
But most people have uh, inquisitive people and they will start there and, and dig deeper and find their own way. Like if he had provided more places to dig deeper um, in, in a wider community sense way, then, then that would have probably sped up the process. Uh, but similarly, I mean, you mentioned the, the kind Volans Fellowship that I got from John Elkinton and the people in, in London at, at Volans. And I mean, John Elkinton's book, um, Green Swans, The Coming Age of Regenerative Capitalism, also clearly, I mean, listen to the subtitle, it plays into wanting to transform the incumbents. And in doing so, it is maybe not the philosophically most grounded and, and kind of um, transformative book in that series of books on regeneration. But for John Elkington, one of the wise elders of the sustainability movement, to write a book on regeneration and the need for business to move in that direction and to put his effort um, in in the, the sort of like whatever, how many stages of careers he's had in his life, but he's, he's yeah, putting his, yeah. uh, probably you, you could say the, 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 the main brunt of, of his remaining creative power as a professional into building up a young consultancy with together with Luis that, that, that brings in a group of people that that will take this into business more power to him and um, for me that it's it's always just to double check with all these consultancy approaches is like when you go into the very often heard phrase that's as far as i can take my client <laughs> um for me to be regenerative means and to be in an integrity means that if you hear yourself think that <laughs> that's exactly where you have to go with your client and and any kind of consultancy that doesn't go there is somehow slowing down the process and actually somewhat part of predatory delay um and i find that that, that happens with most of the larger um kind of sustainability and and whatever consultancies that, that of course they they love the people they work with and they have an overhead and they need to um bring enough money in to pay the payroll. And so they're, they're not as independent as small individual consultants who basically can say, I'm going to be in integrity, say what I think, use it or don't use it, but um, I'm not going to sell my soul. <laughs> and, and that's much more poss possible with a small consultancy business than with a, with a very large one. But um, yeah, I. that said, I really hope that what they're building right now with the young team at Volans is is a young dynamic team that will use that the springboard that clearly is John's amazing legacy and life's work in in the business arena, um, and and take that conversation really deep and that that would be wonderful. I, I love John and Louise. They've both been on the podcast. They do great, and I think they are wise elders. And and I see the new young team emerging with some real positive things. I appreciate your input because the value, uh, your 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 thoughts, and and that on the direction because trying to make sense and gain wisdom out of what's out there, what people are hearing, how how to interpret it, how to use the tools in your book. We've talked a lot about place. Uh, and in all of this, and a thought that are, that comes up to me, I'm a big fan and mentor. So, to, or mentor of mine was, and form of reference for me was Lynn Margulis, and she basically, you know, said, "Human health, our health, your health, my health is." a microcosmos of the earth around us in, in more respects and talked about symbiosis and that this, this microbial health about the place where we live is really uh, dependent upon our health and what, what, what we're like in our world. She, you know, she wrote numerous books, the, the symbiotic planet is one or, or the microcosmos, you know, and uh, Carl Sagan was her first husband. I always like to say it that way instead of uh, she was the first wife of Carl Sagan. I, I like it that way a lot better. And he did the cosmos and and, and they co collaborated with, you know, uh, James Lovelock and, and many other greats around the world. But how much is her formulating and turning the scientific community on its head saying, we've misunderstood 
Darwin's meaning of natural selection and survival of the fittest. Um, that that's never how the world's worked with neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism to our world works in symbiosis um, and in cooperation and collaboration and this tie to regeneration. How does that tie in to, to your work and your thoughts and feelings on regeneration and how, how has it helped us to kind of shift that misunderstanding of, of natural selection? It's central to it for the Western world view. I mean, indigenous worldviews understood that kind of perspective before, but now we have a science about it. Um, I mean, I, I was taught by James Lovelock in, in the early 2000s at Schumacher College, and um, unfortunately I never met Lynn, but um, she was a key contributor to Gaia theory and the role of microbiota in Gaia is what she cr contributed into James Lovelock's thinking about it. And it's important to understand that scientifically we can look at life either through organizing ideas that are about species and individuals and that that then makes us formulate a particular theory of life that is based on these individual agents in the system interacting. But we can also look at life as a planetary process in which sort of a bit like the fruit bodies of, of um, mycelium, the, the, the mushroom just pops up, but the, the, the bigger system is un invisible underneath it. And so if each individual and each species is just a temporary manifestation of a dynamic planetary process, which is called life, then the whole theory of how that process self-organizes becomes different because you start from the whole, you don't start from the parts and try to create a counterfeit additive whole, but you you start from a dynamic whole that um, you're actually participating in. And um, that's how life works. Like even the, 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 the physicists um, counter or proof of lack of abundance and therefore scarcity is the second law of thermodynamics. And the time frames of physics are such that they're billions of years, but the time frames of life localized on one planet, um, recent hearings in the US Congress seem to suggest that um, we now know with more certainty than that life also exists on other planets. Um, that's quite big news. And I'm surprised that we're still not processing it as, <laughs> as a culture because it's fundamentally, like for, for decades we've said, um, how would that change how we see ourselves? And um, I watched some of these hearings and <laughs> it's pretty pretty surprising. Anyway, I'm, I'm veering off here. So coming back to the symbiotic nature of life, I, th I think it's the core understanding. Once we understand that life is a planetary process, that we're not individuals, that like there are more non-human cells in us and on us than there are human cells, that we're literally walking ecosystems, that that life and even matter shows up in relationship and through participation of consciousness. It, it just fundamentally shifts the nature of, of, of reality and, and it creates an understanding that to build an image, like competition exists in nature, but it is um, the waves on top of the ocean. It, they're loud, they crash together, they're impressive, so you focus on them. But the water underneath, like the all that depth all the way down to the Marianas Trench is symbiosis, collaboration, and life-creating conditions conducive to life. Just as we had earlier with the the system of, of like like a city is is a living symbiotic organism. And the fact that in a 20 a million people city, there are only um, 15 murders a day is actually not making that city the murder capital of the world. But it's actually a, a proof that fundamentally human beings are capable of coordinating and self-organizing in such a way that 20 million people can live together and there are only... 15 murders. Uh -huh. um, we're, we're just shifting the perspective too much to, towards the the way that co uh, competition and violence sometimes is used in the system to either 
disruptive or to um, to, to, to fine tune it in, in, in some way. But um, the fundamental processes that actually create healthy ecosystems, healthy societies, healthy families, healthy bodies are collaborations of on, on, on multiple levels. And in your question, you mentioned health. And for me, health, that's why my PhD, Design for Human and Planetary Health, um, was called that. I still think that this deepening the regenerative approach through creating a dynamic understanding of transformative resilience and a dynamic understanding of sol a salutogenic approach to health, of uh, improving the capacity of individuals or a community or a system to this to meet disruption and uncertainty as a dynamic way of understanding health is actually how we can integrate a lot of what, what we're doing and also find the qualitative um, assessment of whether we're on the right track. Because the, the problem right now, again, with regeneration is that we're, everybody's trying to create indicators so we can quantify regeneration. But we need qualitative indicators that are ultimately about multi, like perceiving systemic health as an emergent property from cells to organs to individuals to families to communities to bioregions to ecosystems and the planet as a qualitative feedback on are we participating appropriately or not? And and I think that's where where we're going to some extent, like the, the merging the sustainability and the ecosystems restoration and the planetary health and the one health movements into a global um, conversation that is actually talking about the same thing, that if we want to redesign our impact, we have to do it at the scale of communities and bioregions. How you formulate that so beautifully, you, you, you are wonderful, and I thank you. We're, we're coming to an end of our discussion here, and it, it's really just a few more questions. I want to tickle because I've personally attended your first ETH uh, MOOC course online with Tobias Lute and, and uh, watched it, participated, got the certificate. And there's more coming. I would like you to tell us a little bit about that collaboration. And I hear there's um, a certificate of advanced studies and probably even a master's uh, mm -hmm. uh, coming out of that as well. Would love to hear about that, that you're working on. So, yeah, basically, uh, I met Tobias, who was a brilliant uh, young professor at various universities in, in, in Oslo and at ATR Zurich and, and Polytechnico de Milan. Um, and has always worked in this intersection between systems, um, science and design, and um, also his personal passion as a mountain guide and, and outdoor uh, leader and extreme sports fanatic. And, and he, he, through that, he's created a very effective pedagogy that, that blends very well with the pedagogy I use when I create courses with universities, which is and then like including an embodied like my entry point would be more through Joanna Macy's work that reconnects like embodied exercises in nature and and, and counsel like like I mentioned earlier or or mini vi vision like so solos or, or threshold walks and his path is more taking people into physically exhaustive experiences out in nature and through that bringing them into their body and then relating that to the intellectual dimensions of of um, systems mapping and and um, working on, on regenerating whole systems and so we met in an auspicious place in delphi in greece and at a, at a conference and he then asked me to help him co-curate um, a system of four massive open online courses and they became so successful that um, normally the first run of a massive open online course has like 50 friends of the people organizing it, better testing the material. And we put it out there. And um, before we knew it, we had uh, 2,500 people from 101 country doing the first one that you were on. And by now, the Designing Resilient Regenerative Systems um, Mighty Networks platform that has various cohorts on it is, is over 4,500 4, people strong. And all of this in, in a year and a half. Um, and 
built on that success, Etihad woke up to, oh, they must be onto something if there's that much resonance. And so Tobias had it easier to then convince them that, that it was an option for Etihad to build on the kind of free and open and accessible global offer of the MOOC, a, of course, much more expensive um, leading university of Europe um, certificate of advanced study. And, and that, the first one is now starting in September. I think they're still taking um, applications. And there's a wonderful um, global cohort of professionals um, doing this course. So, so people will learn a lot just from each other. Um, and, and great people invited as guests like um, Fritjof Kapra and Nora Bateson and, 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 and very interesting um, live guests on the course. And these certificates of advanced studies that will match the MOOCs, so the MOOC is part of delivering the material, but then the certificate of advanced studies has a smaller group and more face-to-face -face time, um, they collectively will then build something which which is a um, executive master's in advanced studies um, on from sustainability to regeneration, and it, it beautifully blends like what what Tobias and I are actively trying to do is to within one of Europe's leading engineering and science universities, uh, one of the four universities in Europe that are in the top twenty in the world, um, to establish a pathways practice and embodied practice of working on rege uh, regeneration and resilience that um, values the contribution of science and technology, but brings science back to science and not to scientism. And because they're good scientists in Etiha, they can actually ad be addressed at that level. Uh, and so we're building that bridge of saying there are ways of bringing intuition, sensing and feeling into this way of working on community and regionally led regeneration. And we need to exactly have that conversation between how can we be informed by different ways of knowing? How can we include qualitative feedback and not just quantitative feedback? And how do we put science and technology in its place as servants, not as don't you see these processes just drive us along, like the whole kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of exponential tech that everybody in the Bay Area has bought, bought into. We can choose to say, no, um, we can't use that much energy and that much material. And, and, and so for me, it's been a really wonderful dance because Tobias has brought me closer back into the research sciences and, and the importance of science and engineering um, because I'm a bit of a Luddite and I have helped Tobias move more into the the, the softer side. So we, we, we've had a beautiful um, learning and unlearning and learning together as we were developing the course and, and it seems to be landing really well with people. So I, I think it's, uh, I mean, of course, um, uh, I would say that because I'm involved, but I, I think it is one of the, the, the most groundbreaking academic courses that are offering material um, regarding regeneration on the planet at the moment, not just in terms of content, but also in terms of pedagogy and in terms of the, the network it's in uh, uh, connecting people into. I love the course. It was so super. And we did a little bit of a mini uh, course teaser workshop when, when we were at your 2040 in La Pointe, Switzerland, which is very nice for people who hadn't seen that. They really enjoyed it and uh, talked about that. And I, I'm excited to do the other ones. I missed the second version of it because I um, had conflicting times, but I'm definitely going to complete all of them. And I'm actually thinking about the certificate of advanced studies. I actually was speaking to you about um, some good mentors for my PhD in ecological economics that I want to do um, coming down the line. You have already several of your versions of your book in other languages. I think it's five or four. Eight. 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 Wow. Mm -hmm. And you're currently thinking about uh, gaining help, talking about other local versions and, and things. What are exactly are you working on in the future of other languages, other local versions and things, possibly an audio book that you want to tell well, us about? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've realized that there's a lot of people who don't read anymore, but do avidly listen to podcasts and, and audiobooks. And so I, I realized that um, just in terms of reaching more people, um, creating an audiobook is really important, even if the book is by now a few years old. But I, th I think because of how it is structured, it continues to grow in relevance rather than... Um, like some people make the mistake of looking at the cover and saying, oh, it's published in 2016. I'll read a more recent one on this field. Um, but so, yeah, the, the very fact that it's still being translated means that people see, see that value. Um, and it it's first came out in Brazil and then it came out in uh, in Spain and it's in, out in Italy under a different title, um, The Art of Regenerating the World. It's called in, in uh, Italian. Um, and then... It's um, there's a Portuguese version that is the Portuguese Portuguese of Portugal. Um, there's a version in Slovak that is still not out in book form, but only digitally. Um, people are talking about a Croatian version. The, the Danish version is already translated and come out early. No, no, not a, a, a Turkish, a Norwegian, and a Swedish version. Um, but the and then there's the possibility that AXA Climate, who've just recently started a course um, in engaging their business clients in regeneration, which is called the Butterfly Program, that I contributed to. And they um, are looking at helping to translate a whole bunch of the books we mentioned earlier into French. And um, maybe the, my book will be among them, like uh, along with Giles's and, and Laura's book and so on. Um, so that's the French version. I'm particularly keen on finding, like there are people in India who are trying to explore how it could uh, be um, produced in Hindi. And there's some people in Taiwan working on a Chinese wo version. or, or hope, But but I, any kind of um, links to people to publishers or people, foundations who would support um, versions in India or in Japan or in um in China, I'd, I'd be really interested in in hearing from people because I I, I still feel it has potential of, of creating a more global conversation. If that like just like transition towns popped up in in every place, if the this conversation around regenerative culture and our global brotherhood as one species linking into our indigenous um, regenerative past can be brought to the forefront in these like divisive times of, of cancel culture and and global power proc, uh, block thinking, I think that could be really healing and, and necessary. So I'm 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 still looking for uh, to bring it out in, in other languages, and um, we'll see how many languages we get to. Well, we're definitely going to uh, blast this podcast out and and everything in the show notes of of the podcast. We'll put the links to your podcast to your medium um, where you do fabulous things all, uh, uh, every week uh, on medium. You're very active and um, list all your social medias and everywhere where people can find you and we'll, we'll help promote you a, as much as possible. The last question I have for you is my standard question that, you know, and, and I, I, um, also know the hesitation uh, through our discussions and others will know as well now if they've listened this far. Um, the old Buckminster Fuller question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And how uh, would you answer that question as a closing statement for our podcast? Diverse regenerative cultures that find it in themselves to become expressions of place again, not owners of place. They become um, healers and restorers of biodiversity, of bioproductivity, of, of, of abundance. And that um, in finding their kinship with all life and understanding their own eternity as life, uh, take themselves a little less serious with regard to having to survive into God knows how many more millennia. And through exactly that, through taking themselves less serious, they would probably end up um, 
more capable of living into maturity because I think we have a role to play as a species but um, if we think that our role was to outperform biology and become a kind of um, silicon based robot based consciousness uh, downloaded into a chip like the kind of singularity university Ray Kurzweil X prize version of the future um, then I think we we've lost it but if we if we steer back towards life and we create a diverse human culture that expresses multiplicity and unity that that sees itself united as one species and as life but allows diverse ways of interpreting and being in the world to manifest in each place as an expression of that place because it understands that our diversity of opinion included is part of where life draws um, innovation and, and new ways of um, bringing about more life from. And so uh, I'm still hopeful that we will get to that future. I'm just not sure how hard we will have to suffer and how traumatic the, the transition will be. Daniel Christian Wall, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas and talking to us about your fabulous book. It's uh, always an arm's length grab from anywhere I'm at in my office. I love it. And we're going to uh, talk about it and promote it a lot more. I hope we, our paths cross much more in the future and that uh, you have a great time in Bristol and a nice detox, digital detox now for the next little while great. as you go into your break. Thank you so much, Daniel. Well, lo lovely, and it's also lovely to make this my final kind of online session um, before my break. So really lovely to talk to you, and thanks so much for supporting the, getting the word out there because I know you're, you're a real genius in, in um, putting important information to more people. So thank you for that. It's going to happen. We'll work together a lot more in the future, and, and we'll hope that all your, all your visions for this work and what you do gets out there to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful time. Mm -hmm.